Welcome to the Apologetics.com radio show, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. I'm Harry Edwards, your host for the evening, and tonight we'll be discussing some of the contents of Sean McDowell and Tim, Tim Muloff's new book, And the Stalemate. What is the uh, subtitle? M- move past cancel culture to meaningful conversations. And... Um, I mean, the subtitle of the book tells me that if there is ever a time when we need this wisdom, most it is now. I still remember a time not too long ago when you had to be sophisticated to discern the adverse changes to the cultural climate. But now all one has to do is look at current events, especially social media, and it's easy to scratch your head and wonder if you're still on planet Earth. Uh, It's like waking up to a whole new world. There's a feeling of despair, hopelessness, or one of my favorites, anomie, an erosion of social and or ethical standards in society. According to Emile Durkheim, who's a French sociologist in the 1900s, or 19th century, I mean, anomie is a state in which expectations are are unclear and the social system that keeps people functioning has broken down. He believed that anomie or normlessness could result in feelings of deep despair and worthlessness for individuals. So tonight we want to understand our times better. How did we get here and hopefully offer a way forward? That is the task of a cultural apologist. So to help me with this, I've called on experts and friends for some fun talking about these uh, issues. So let's start with Dr. Jacob Daniel. How are you doing? I'm doing good. The fact that you called me expert makes me rethink whether I'm, I should be here or not. You are an expert, <laughs> my friend, yes. <laughs> uh, good to be here, Harry, as always. Um, grateful for each show that we do and be able to reach people with the truth of the gospel and the impact that it's leaving on people uh, grateful and i have two special guests they're first timers here and i'm very excited to introduce them michael butterfield and um your lovely wife anna uh how are you guys doing we're doing great yeah okay (laughs) we're both very happy to be here I've known these two fine uh, folks from, wow, our Biola days. Uh, We used to work Mm -hmm. together, and uh, I always remember the times we've had really good, deep discussions while working. So I miss those days, but I'm glad you guys are local. So, and, you know, we've hung out several times, and now we get to do it on the air. So, but, uh, Michael, t- tell our listeners what you've been up to. What are, what are you studying? I know you're studying um, at, at a grad level, and uh, why are you doing that, and, and what are you studying? Mm. Yeah, so I'm still at Biola in the graduate program in Talbot, studying, uh, getting a master's in philosophy, and the, the aim of that is very closely related to apologetics, but always wanting to, to go deep into the fundamentals, the foundations, the the dusty edges of thought and possibilities and, and see what what suggests itself as most likely. And so that's part of the love of the truth, which relates to my love of the Lord and trying to understand reality really uh, a bit better. And um, I, I would love to do more of that in the future. That's so. great. Yeah, the church needs more deep thinkers like you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Anna, how about you? I know you're also in the middle of trying to finish up your MA in Christian apologetics, right? How's that going, and what do you plan to to do with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am getting near the end of my master's in apologetics at Biola, which is awesome. Um, I started out as a recruiter in undergrad, and I ended up recruiting myself for the program. <laughs> so, um, but it's it's been great, and um, actually, it's been a blast to have both of our degrees because I think apologetics sometimes is putting the tools in your hand, but then philosophy is providing the depth. So we get to actually share a lot of our learning, which is a blast, and we actually both also have film as our background, and so I think. For both of us, using media, using story, and being able to um, to impact the culture 
and answer the questions that people really, you know, have deeply and through how God made them to be and how he made them to think um, is a passion for both of us. And yeah, a question for you. Yeah. So when you have free time or when you when you talk to each other, do you talk more philosophy and theology or do you talk more about films and media? Oh. Mm, probably both. <laughs> yeah, definitely both, but I think we'd probably lean more towards philosophy and towards apologetics, partly mm. cuz it often is integrating deeply with our day-to-day life and walking with the Lord and trying to help other people to walk with him too. So I don't know. What would you say to that? It's interesting. I, I'm glad you mentioned theology because I think it, it the sort of the Christian faith and the deep considerations of our lives or mm. scriptures or or the arts and communications, like it, it does seem like it. And it yeah. all dovetails there often. Yeah. And, and I'm not ex- exaggerating. So you guys are a couple. You guys are married, and uh, you have wonderful conversations, I'm sure. But I am not exaggerating when I say that apologetics or some aspect of apologetics has strengthened me and Minerva's marriage, for sure. Mm-hmm. I think – I don't know if I shared that with you because, see, uh, we were talking about logic driving over here. Yeah. When – we both agree, my wife and I agree on the basic ways of argumentation, then we are both accountable to those laws. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she calls me up on some of my fallacious reasoning, (laughs) and I can't deny it. You know, I go, yep, you're right, you know. (laughs) So it's kind of neat. But anyways, we're not here to talk about logic or why you should get into apologetics, uh, although it's kind of related. But we're talking about Sean McDowell's and Tim Muloff's book, and the stalemate, move past cancel culture to meaningful conversations. Highly recommend it. And like I mentioned, I think now more than ever, we Christians, we have to lead in this. We need to be able to direct conversations in um, c- civilly, you know, and, and loving ways. But it's also true, many of us are just either not equipped or we've been so into uh, culture today that we've forgotten how to be uh, perhaps uh, loving or our speech be seasoned with love and grace, right? So tonight we want to cover some of those things. But let me, let me ask you guys, what is your impression on the book? What are some first impressions? Yeah, um, I would say it's a book one should definitely read. Um, I've read the initial chapters. I still need to finish the book, but I would say that it it does give you a picture of where we are in a culture uh, today and how we can actually engage and move past, as you are titling this very show, move past the stalemate and come to a place where we maintain uh, the platform where we engage in civil dialogue. And I think that's the emphasis of the book and much needed especially with cancel culture. I think one of the things that we've canceled is the very idea of platform where we can come with different views and engage with each other in the pursuit of truth. And I think this book is one of those books that will help you to really understand the need of such a space where we can bring ideas together in a manner that we don't lose the respect of the other individual while we are doing that. Yeah, uh, the author was mentioning in their introduction that some of the studies included in this book are about, you know, more than 10 years old and... uh, the author made a comment, how times have changed. In other words, it's even worse. Mm-hmm. So let, let me just mention a few things. So back then, uh, apparently 2016, uh, during the presidential election, nearly a third of people reported that they have stopped talking to a friend or a family member due to the political disagreements. That's 2016. You, you can imagine now, right? Here's another fact. Nearly two-thirds of Americans say they stay quiet about their political beliefs due to the fear of offending coworkers or managers, resulting in losing their job. They have good reason to worry. In the same study, nearly 31% of respondents favored firing business executives if it became known they donated to the Trump campaign, and 22% if to Biden. I could go on and on here, but... Um, I think uh, the, the, there's one thing, I mean, the book 
at least initially doesn't touch on this, we need to understand the whole landscape has been shifted. I mean, the world that we lived in uh, a few, a couple of decades ago is not the world that we live in today. And what has contributed to that is the idea that we have shifted from a place of concrete ideas unifying people together. Um, in, in the Western context, if we see the idea of law, around which you centered around not violating the law. And uh, if, if you violate the law, you are pronounced either innocent or guilt, uh, guilty. Uh, whereas what we shifted from that to a very much feeling-based, identity-based culture. In so doing, we find the collective that we belong to. And when, when you violate the norms of that collective, you're canceled, basically you're excommunicated. Yeah. That's what's happened. And I think we've come to that culture where we have we have dismantled or removed all that which is concrete or we consider it as concrete and have moved to a place of feeling-based, uh, a place of uh, uh, not so concrete, more more fluid place. And in so doing, uh, we, we've not found anything to ground ourselves on much. Yeah. And I think that's the shift that has happened that has resulted in the cancel culture that we see today. I think that's a major factor. We'll touch more on that. In fact, in a previous show, we did mention something like that a lot of the things that bound us are no longer present, mm-hmm. uh, hence anomy, right? Uh, it's a famous uh, thing, uh, phenomenon that Emil Durkheim made popular in his writings. Well, let's dive into it. So Sean started the book, and um, he mentions certain uh, a few events that have pretty much radically changed uh, the world. Let, let's get into it. Um, calls this this perfect storm. Storm number one is people are hurting. COVID had something to do with that. Let me try to go through all of the storms here. There's clashing of worldviews. We'll talk about that in a minute. There is uh, social media, the advent of social media. And uh, I think the, fir- uh, the fourth one is communication breakdown. Th- those are the four major storms that have occurred to, to make this perfect storm, apparently. All of these things converging all at once. Let's uh, tackle each one. People are hurting. It, it's true. Uh, I, I won't mention the specifics, but um, someone very close to me reported that they had to be called into work literally like two hours ago because uh, a young person attending this conference was on top of the parking structure cr- crying. And uh, so they alerted um, the campus uh, security in, in this area, and uh, apparently they have uh, rules and regulations. They they ask the person who is in distress a series of questions, and when it's determined that they could be um, harmful to, to themselves or others, they are adamant about having that person leave. So it, it, it's it's really kind of a weird situation nowadays. You know, it's it's not good on on any level. Uh, I, I feel like nobody wants to be responsible. That's number one. Number two, that these things happen apparently like on a regular basis. So it, it's true. Uh, like I said, just happened two hours ago. I, I heard about it. So. Uh, people are hurting. Uh, may, maybe we can attribute it to what you said. How we don't, we no longer have commonalities. Uh, we, we talked about it uh, last month with Linnaeus Pizzito, uh, and you guys are way younger. You might not know this, but mm-hmm. it used to be that um, you would have TV shows, and, um, and and you couldn't really record them. So everybody watched the same show like every Friday night, and then. You guys got back from the weekend, and you all talked about it, and uh, nobody had advanced screening of it. I mean, you, you just knew it all at once. You you guys were doing the same thing all at once, you know. So you have those cultural things that bound you, like even just music, right? N- nobody just purchased a single and put it on their iPod. It's No, y- you listen to it on the radio, and it's playing. Everyone heard it at the same time. So you, we've lost those kinds of things. Uh, we're all, like you said, you know, we're so individualistic. There's a niche for everything. It's hard to belong mm-hmm. when there's nothing to belong to. So, all right, so people are hurting. That's not hard to see. Um, what about clashing worldviews? What, what do you guys think of that? Clashing worldviews. Yeah, he seemed to have uh, kind of a thick view of, of that. Um, I can't remember all the details of what he, how he broke it down there. Um, 
Uh, but it, did you touch on story at that section? I, f- I forget now, but um, there's this certainly deep disagreements in fundamentals about reality. Hmm. Um, well, first of all, what is a worldview? Now, there are different ways of looking at it. Uh, so right. worldview, um, it, it, it's what forms your view of the world, if, if put simply. Yeah. Um, there are there are two ways to look at it. One, I believe, which I hold to, is the idea that is different from the other view, which says that it's like wearing a lens through which you see the reality. Mm-hmm. It, it, it explains, it defines, it analyzes for you the way you perceive uh, the world that you, that you experience. Whereas as a Christian, I believe that it's not that you put on a lens. It's a new set of eyes that God gives you. There's no other way you can see the world but the way that he would want you to if you are truly a Christian, a born-again Christian. So it's the way you perceive and understand the reality that you experience uh, in your life. Um, it, it is done through the, through the means of ideas uh, that you are impacted from outside. At the same time, ideas that you form based on uh, the experiences that you have with the outside world. So it's the constitution of all those together and how you see reality and experience it. So how how are the different worldviews clashing? So I just had one thought, and this also kind of connects in with what we were talking about before, people feeling broken. But I I guess, and maybe the, I think that what how you describe worldview is great. And I, I think a lot of times people are unaware of having a worldview. Um, and I think that something that has been useful as like maybe even helping people see that they do is like asking questions that are fundamental about, you know, what do you think, where do you think we came from or or what do you think we're here for or are we here, you know, and as you answer those questions, it, it begins to reveal that there is something, there's a belief underlying, you're connecting features of reality and your emotion and your belief about yourself and everything to like what you think is true about reality um whether you're correct or not is another question but um the clash of the worldviews is fascinating even on a relational level i think because i actually really appreciated this one quote that they said um early in the intro which is contempt contempt is saying not only I am angry, but also I no longer care if the relationship ends. Mm. I'll state my position and then shake the dust off my feet as I leave. Mm. And that quote really struck out, stuck out to me because what it revealed to me was um, that there's actually kind of an erosion of commitment and relationship. And, and I think even connected to worldview, maybe not in a philosophical way, but in a relational way is like, what makes a relationship worthwhile? Like, that is a worldview question, in my opinion. As a Christian, I answer, God loves you. And so there's a relational quality to loving you because I'm following Jesus, like my master, and doing that. But if you don't think that that's true, then there is like a lack of safety when worldviews clash. Because if you disagree, but there's no commitment relationally there, then... Yeah going to fall apart you you point to very some something very important here so if we see the way i think we can uh, dichotomize worldviews in two two ways one is the 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 idea of loving in uh, on on the basis of intuitions one's in internal longings right mm-hmm. whereas when we see in the scripture we are called to love our enemies it's a command given for us to how can you command someone to love Imagine that. Love is a property that has to come from within volitionally. But he, he, throughout the scripture, we say God commands, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. It's a commandment, right? So there's a property within the Christian worldview or of the way we understand love, which is directed towards the other. It's, it looks different from the way the world understands it. And that's exactly where the clash is. And I think when people are asking questions, we should be... Uh, First of all, clarifying this presupposition that one has about what they are loving and why they are loving. That needs to be the first step towards engaging with individuals. And I think those two worldviews, when they come together, they will always clash. That's why we need to be really be very forthright, I would say, in terms of, and not only forthright, but also 
I remember this. Uh, one of my very good friends, he once said that in a Christian's life, there comes a time with re- relation to your family or friends or whoever may, it may be, when, it, uh, when it's about truth and preaching the gospel or teaching the gospel or sharing the gospel, you have to really decide whether you love your friend more than your friendship. Right? That's an important way of loving. That's a Christian way of loving. That's where you're involving your, not only your f- feelings and emotions, but also your will to love the other to the point that it hurts. Yeah. And I think that's not the way world understands love. And I can divide worldviews into two, those two categories. So when someone comes and asks us a question or if, uh, is longing for something and we are engaging with them uh, with the means of the gospel, I think that's the first thing we should clarify. What is our definition of love? What is it that we are seeking in this matter when we are seeking truth? Um, and I think we have to have those dialogues for yeah. that very thing to take place. You know, when we say clashing worldviews, I don't know if... Uh the authors mentioned it, but sure, uh, let's say a Christian worldview the worldview would clash against maybe a secular worldview would clash against a Hinduistic worldview. But what's also important to note is there are the worldview itself could be clashing internally. Mm. So one may not think they have a worldview, but perhaps their understanding of marriage is not consistent maybe with their understanding of abortion or may not be consistent with how they view church and state issues. You know, So even within those big uh, issues, uh, they're, they're not all coalescing together. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to be consistent or else – uh, we, it, it's hard to move forward in, in life, you know. Uh, yeah, and th- and that's where the role of the church comes in. That's I right. think the church has to take that responsibility of educating. And we've been commanded to teach all that Christ has taught us to. Yes, it's yes. a process. It's not a one-time event where God does some kind of magic when we are saved that we get all uh, exhaustive knowledge about the world. No, we, we continue to learn and grow in Christ to the maturity of Christ. And I think that's needed. And church and parachurch ministries and and ministries like ours, apologetics ministries, this is exactly what we are doing, sharing the truth of the gospel, that it, it not only forms, but there are times when it needs to reform the individual from within. Yeah. Well, I just want to, if you're tuning in right now, we are live and we are talking about moving past the stalemate, how to have meaningful conversations in a cancel culture uh, society. All right. So if you want to join our conversation, you might have a comment or question. Uh, Give us a call at 888-995-KKLA. Again, that's uh, 888-995-5552. Maybe you've had an experience where you felt like you got canceled, or maybe you're one of the statistics where you feel like you can't share your views on anything at work because uh, you fear you might get fired for, for your views. Um, the statistics are not not hopeful at all. And if we're not talking, uh, things uh, there are ramifications for that. I shared uh, a story on our drive here about a talk or a conversation I had with Oz Guinness. And he's a brilliant a uh, Christian evangelical leader, and everybody ought to read him. And he's really known for bringing uh, groups together different uh, from from different sorts of uh, worldviews, especially in the political scene. But I asked him once, what happens when your deep convictions are just clashing with the other group or with another person you're seeking to have a conversation with? What happens when fundamentally you just can't make it work? That's a good question. Knowing him, you know, he's the most gracious guy, and uh, his answer surprised me. He just says, you just keep talking. You just keep talking. Now, it, it, it took me a while to see the wisdom in that, but uh, the practical results from that is if you're talking, then you're not physically fighting, right? So it's brilliant. So do we have that attitude, right? As Christians, are we patient enough? Or uh, heaven forbid, right? We f- feel like we always need to win that argument. We have to have the best persuasive and put in logical form all of our arguments, and uh, and that we think we've done our homework. 
So anyways, that's the challenge for us. If you want to uh, chime in, if you have a question or comment, join our conversation. Give us a call, 888-995-KKLA. Again, 888-995-5552. I know we're coming up on a station break pretty soon, but keep that number handy. And uh, let, let's see, real quick, and maybe it might bleed over to the next half hour, but what are uh, two other uh, storm items in this perfect storm? Mm-hmm. One is social media, and the other is poor or bad communication. Communication breakdown. Communication breakdown. You guys want to elaborate on that? Definitely with social media. If you see, we were talking about the way the world has shifted, right? Um, Earlier, you were you, you're talking about this, Harry, that this was w- one directed, right? Information would flow from top down to the people, to the masses. But now what's happening is that everyone from everywhere, uh, everyone holds some kind of authority because they have the means to uh, share their thoughts and ideas and opinions. And also, we, we need to understand that people's opinion has become more like authoritative to themselves. And in so doing, when you have thousands of different opinions... Uh, there is obviously going to be a clash, especially in a space where you're not in, involved with the individual in person. Mm. It's more in, in the air where you are sitting at the back as if there's a distance between what's happening on the screen and what who you are as an individual. That's why we also see that when it comes to individuals engaging with each other on a personal level, that come out to be different individuals, very polite and considerate and everything. Mm-hmm. Whereas in social media, because there's that distance maintained. And there's, anonymity, there's, yeah. Exactly. And in so doing, what, what we're not realizing that social media is one of the key mediums by which we are being catechized. And that's impacting the society very much, including the church. And I think we can talk more about that after the break. Yes, so I hear the music, and you've been listening to Apologetics.com. We will be right Today back after this break. In- well, uh, welcome back to the uh, second half hour of the Apologetics.com radio show, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. I'm Harry Edwards, your host for this evening, and we have been talking about moving past the stalemate how to have meaningful conversations in our cancel culture. Of course, we're getting a lot of the inspiration from this new book by our friends Sean McDowell and Tim Muloff. By the way, I tried to contact them and last minute invite them on the show, but they're both busy. Hey, at least I got a response back, you know, which is cool. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But maybe one of these days, though, we can have him on the show. I know Tim is a frequent guest here. I, I love how he, he likes to hang out with us, and, and uh, we enjoy the, the drive over. But um, so we, we've been talking about the, the whole idea of how we got here and why this perfect storm has created this, this uh, sense of what I'm calling anomia. It, it helps because, at least in my mind, we could reverse engineer some of these things if we know what has caused them. We talked about the clashing of worldviews. We've talked about people are hurting as a result of COVID, social media, just the many voices, no unity in that. People are saying this and that. In fact, true story, all right? Um, So my feed was up. I'm watching videos, whatever. And uh, Minerva just comes up behind me and she literally said how do we know what truth is anymore she actually Mm -hmm. said that go i know it's it's tough because you have this video saying this this video saying this expert saying this this expert how do how do we adjudicate now you know how do we know so it just provides a lot of confusion a lot of confusion all right um how about communication breakdown how is that a factor in where we are today so one thing uh, i felt that the stats that they gave were really striking, especially regarding the no longer talking to someone because they have a different political view than you. And I I think this is also riding off of the social media commentary, which is that social media is designed to generate an emotional response. Like, Mm -hmm. that's how you get someone to click on your video, Mm -hmm. right? And so we're getting kind of tugged in a lot of different directions and it's also it, that makes it really challenging to decide what's worth like the hill that's worth dying on yeah. because you get sucked into a video 
you're like either gun ho for or gun ho against and you're like dang i can't like really feel neutral about this anymore in a conversation i feel very polarized already and i think that it's to me even though i think politics will have a lot of components in worldview that will build to a certain perspective but people might not agree all the way up the line so they might come to different conclusions but because act they might even hold the same values and that you know lead them to a specific place i'm not talking about overtly morally wrong things versus but there's different ways that you can approach it and different values that come to the decision and i think that um i think sometimes because social media can be so polarized or so um emotionally charged that it can end up making it really difficult to say um you know, I don't think it's worth losing this relationship because we disagree about this. Because I know you're not a moral monster just because you chose this. And I know I'm not a moral monster just because I chose this. Probably we agree on some values actually there that led us to this, to our different decisions. But um, I think uh, as as we were talking about this earlier, just it feels like it's kind of important to like, even in thinking about this book, like, what are the conversations that we're talking about having and that we're talking about having even risky conversations with? Because I think having a relationship with someone and talking about the gospel is totally worth it. But is saying like, well, I don't think, you know, whatever, X political thing, you know, is that really the thing you're going to break your relationship up over? I guess that's a question that I ask is like, how are we deciding what conversations are worth taking that relational risk for? Right. I think, Anna, you hit the nail on the head there. And uh, I want to quote th- this one sentence in, in the book, which is so true. I think we can all relate to this. Uh, I think it was Tim that wrote, The more we become entrenched in our beliefs, talking to those with whom we disagree can inadvertently make our beliefs mm. even more rigid. So mm. it, it's – talk about communication breakdown, right? The moment we utter a differing view, the opposing view gets even more entrenched. It's it's so weird, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but I actually do feel like that. So it's like pointless now to have – to comment on someone's Facebook or whatever be, because it's like – you know it's not going to be received well. And um, I, li- I like, yeah. uh, I think this is Tim's word, uh, phrase, right? The my my side bi- bias. I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my bias. side bias. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we all have that, the my side bias. Um, it, it's, it's staggering. I, I won't name names or issues, but it's like, a meme pops up, and then all of a sudden, this person says, "Oh, I fully agree." It's like, really, the meme number one is ridiculous, and then you agree just because there's a meme in there, and it's it's so weird how people are rallying around stupid things. <laughs> I wonder if there's a bit of a uh, the the relation the relational space, and you were mentioning the kind of forfeiting it or throwing it away or almost they described it almost like despising it shaking you know, dust off your feet a little bit picture there um but if we uh they they talk about this sort of is it was the transferring transferring theory yeah yeah the sort of transmitting, yeah. transmitting transmitting view of communication we'll talk about that yeah but go ahead introduce the topic there something about the sort of um direct communicating pack, sort of package of things that you want to propose or state about your view uh, versus a more a, kind of a thicker cultural relating. And, right. and what was the term they used? Ritual. Ritual. Ritual view of communication versus transmission view. of Yeah. Right. And I imagine the, the sort of calcifying picture they give there of, oh, someone's just telling me their view again. Right. Right. If, you're, if that's kind of all that's going on interpersonally, you know, like you go – visit for Thanksgiving and uncle so-and-so is just telling you this thing again. Yeah. That's not going to, you're not going anywhere. Right. Because the, my bias, uh, the, my side bias gets just reinforced. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's so funny, right? I mean, here's another cultural phenomenon, the whole me too movement, just the tagline alone says me too. You know, it's like, 
it's almost like we're in second grade again. Uh, like within kids. the church, I wonder how much of this is to be blamed to the fact that there there has been a, a, a huge huge chasm built between the pulpit and the the congregation. Yes, for sure. Uh, to the point that even today, I mean, a lot of people we may talk to may agree that it's okay to actually sit at home and do church, right? Uh, so losing that concrete idea of community, mm-hmm. coming together, engaging with each other. So if we are engaging only in social media and finding that as the only means of communication and not through the means of gathering in person, doing life together, engaging with each other, I think that is exactly what's causing, in my opinion, within the church, this fraction that we are seeing. Curious if there's a, a, um, there's a lot of venues where we're talked to. Speaking of radio, you know, you're in a classroom. You're not right. The teacher's right. Like 95% of the time. And you're just hoping to keep up. The pulpit, there's a space where you're kind of being spoken to. Maybe um, work environment, there's, a, there's like new, new work in like a more collaborative, more uh, in some ways like bottom-up open communication things going on in or it's like psychological safety and those sorts of things. Um, but I'm just imagining if there's uh, like, where's the social media space where you just are listened to? You know, it's like I'm thinking of like online therapy or something. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just that you put your content out there, but you actually are, are listened to. Like, and you think of the healing that goes on in our lives through being listened to or being known. Perhaps that's a more relational picture there. Um, and I, I think that 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 might be part of some of the things they're getting to um, of making space for relating to uh, listening well um, to the point that you're not quick to maybe uh, kind of quick to judge or quick to um, toss someone off and out of your life because you disagree, but having enough bandwidth of maybe we could say of love to let them, to let them share. And there's a relationship that's possible there. There was a quote that, also, and I think this is probably hinting at that later content about ritual and transmission, but um, he said, here's a key insight. If you violate the relational level, then people don't care about your content. Yeah. And that we are at that point that it's like, if I know you don't really care about me, like, I'm not sure I'm able to listen to you. I don't know that that was like the case in every generation, like leading up to this point, but I, I think... I, I definitely can kind of agree with yeah. that. It's like, I don't know. Like, if you're being a jerk, I'm not sure I'm ready to even be able to, like, reasonably think about what you're saying. What's that famous saying? Uh, people don't care how much mm-hmm. you know until they know how much you care. I think mm-hmm. there's some truth to that. I know it's a little cringeworthy, but I <laughs> actually think there's deep wisdom in that saying. At the same time, I think we can't discount the fact that, and this is uh, a fact that I see uh in evangelistic efforts towards Muslims. So you need to also take into consideration the cultural context of people uh, that they come from. I see, uh, especially in the Eastern world and also Muslim world, uh, the the idea of debate, the idea of engagement uh, with more passion is seen to be more credible. Mm. Uh, So I've always seen, I know of uh, apologists reaching out to Muslim world. If you watch their engagement you would qualify them to be, oh, this is not how we do Christian things. But that's exactly how you need to be doing in that context for people to really understand and grasp the truth of the gospel. I'm not seeing a lot of relationship building happening there. I'm not discounting the fact that relationship shouldn't happen. But in that context, it's the idea, the truth, as it uh, peers through their heart and mind, that brings people to commit to the truth because they've never come out of their uh, their context ever. But when they're confronted with the truth and they respond to that, I've seen many Christians, many many Muslims coming to Christ, not through the means of relationship. Maybe that might happen later in their context, but it is also through the means of truth. So we really need to judge. So that's your counter a little bit. A little push bit back, exactly. push back. To t- all right. So it's that's not a cookie cut approach. I would say. Hmm. In the American context, in in the context of your neighborhood, it might be a barbecue might work for you to invite them, build that relationship, and then offer the truth in the manner in which they will receive. But that may not be the context among a Hindu or a Muslim. 
It will be the confrontation. Yeah. And we see that time and again Jesus does that. There are times when he would attend a wedding and do a miracle to bring people to the knowledge of who he is. But at the same time, there are times when he would rebuke them for who they are and what they have done. Uh, so we need to be judging a situation and offering. That's why I'm not of the opinion that winsomeness, when we use that term, mm. ha- who decides that it's only through the means of softness and compassion that you can only win. Sometimes it's through the means of tough love that you have to show and speak the truth in a matter. And that can be more winsome than a softness. We'll let Tim know where his <laughs> error was. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Oh, I wish Tim were here. He'd, we'd have so much fun just going back and forth. Yeah. No, I mean, sure, yeah. You said a while ago you don't like to use that word balance. But, yeah, this is a, a case in which we need balance. I get it. Yeah. You have been listening to Apologetics.com radio. If you're tuning in, we are live. And if you want to join our discussion, we have like 15 minutes. So I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. want to uh, jump in. But it's 888-995-KKLA, 888-995-5552. Maybe you've been a victim of cancer culture. Maybe you need to get equipped in how to handle uh, some of these dissenting voices. How do you do it with love and grace and how to be effective, how to be heard, and um, mm. most, most of all that they know that you are a Christian and that you care. And again, if you're Os Guinness, that you are committed to keep the dialogue open no matter what. Keep it going. Keep it going. So, I, I think in in the first two chapters alone, there are some nuggets here, and uh, I want to offer a couple things. And by way of application, I believe uh, this is super helpful. So, Tim Uloff makes a distinction between two kinds of communication. One is called a transmission view, and the other is a ritual view. So, the transmission view is essentially... Just like you were saying, Michael, just here's a packet of information. It's nicely put together. Receive it and understand it. There you go. So a lot of the work of apologists is sort of like that, um, for good or for bad. That's just how it is. And in our culture where we have been taught in a cognitive, purely cognitive way, we're, we're Cartesian in our <laughs> mindset, right, in our methods, uh, I love the Enlightenment, but I think there was just a little overemphasis on uh, Descartes here. And so that's all we've known. So in, in education, in relationships, in transactions, whatever, it's, it's all in the mind first, right? So we've been trained that way. So that's the transmission view. You just make your best arguments, and there it is. If you don't get it, it's on you. Even if you fully understand the person's um, where they're coming from, their point of view, what they've explained to you. You've, you've analyzed it. You've regurgitated it back, and y- you've mentioned that you fully understand it. Tim is saying that's not even enough anymore because, again, it, it just fortifies that my side bias. So that's not even enough. That's not even loving enough, apparently. Yeah. So Tim... And we've done a lot of shows using Tim's book, and he's been here many times. Uh, so we, we love him. We, we love him. And um, But in this, I think he's making the case that we should adopt the ritual view of communication. And what he's saying about the ritual view is it is focused primarily on the person. And there's a lot of empathy that is involved. So it's, I, I forget the term he uses, but pretty much a, as you empathize, you are taking that person's place, so to speak, and feel what they're feeling, think what they're thinking, and see if that m- maybe helps change your mind a little bit and come closer to their point of view and not not just understand and maybe even admit you can't understand, but you are fully there with them. And Again, if, if anything, if you forget anything about that, this ritual view, it's really empathy and relationships. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it, yeah, more, more, more than even the arguments. Can I provide a yeah. counter to yeah, this? Yeah, go ahead. Um, that's, and that's your job this, tonight. This is w- <laughs> where I would disagree with Tilma M- 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 you know, it, it, yeah. Only in this manner. I'm not against the fact that we need to be empathizing on this, but we need to be choosing what we are empathizing with. 
you can't empathize on every matter. Let me give an example. Um, in, the, in the scripture, we read very clearly that Christ sympathizes with our sin. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. He becomes a sin for us. He does not sin. If he was empathizing with us in our sin, he would sin and thereby empathize with us. So we have to distinguish between empathizing and sympathizing. And symp- sympathy has become a negative term in our culture today, but we have to revive it again and bring it back. So when it comes to sin matters, I can, I can empathize with the other saying that I'm a sinner just like you, redeemed by the grace of Christ. But in a sin matter of an individual, if you agree that this is a sin matter, You can't empathize with that person. You can sympathize in saying that I'm a sinner just like I have my own challenges Christ has redeemed me with. Wearing someone else's shoe in agreement with what they're doing, that would be a dangerous place to tread onto. And I'm not saying that Tim Mulaff is suggesting that at all. Uh, But I think there's a danger if we're going to empathize with the other on all matters for the sake of bringing the gospel to them. So we need to be choosing mm-hmm. what we are empathizing and what we are sympathizing. Yeah. Just a point of clarification. You might be mixing the two because empathizing is in and feeling, right? It's two words put together, mm-hmm. in and feeling. So in your example, we're all sinners. I think we can empathize. I think sympathy is just one step removed from the situation. So it's like you're in an accident, I see that you've been hurt. I sympathize with you, meaning like, ah, I'm glad it's not me. Uh, that's, so, I think that's sympathy. You know, like, sorry, it happened to you. No, but, no. So that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is... No, but is, what I'm saying, it, that's what the meaning of sy- the distinction between sympathy and empathy. Uh, I, I would put it different way. Sympathizing would be just like Christ sympathizes with our sin. Uh, he becomes sin on our behalf without sinning. And I think that's what we need in terms of matters of sin, matters of what we are seeing in culture with regards to gender issues, with regards to abortion issues, that I do sympathize with you that what you're going through, uh, you might have experienced that yourself, but empathizing would be wearing their shoes and agreeing agreeing with the very fact that that sin is somehow, uh, for example, uh, uh, on the question of pronouns, uh, that's why Sean McDowell takes a different position than Tim, Tim Muehoff. Um, Till Muhaf's position is one of I'm okay with using the pronouns. Why? Because there's an empathy, and in so doing, I think there's a danger then in also justifying the fact that okay, it's actually um, allowed for. There's a danger there. I'm saying I'm not saying that one should not empathize, but there's a danger uh, of the fact that we can allow for those things, thing, sins to persist without confronting them yeah. with the truth of the gospel. Okay, I'm going to bring this caller. Thanks, Jacob, for that. Uh, I'm going to bring this caller, and this caller, Michael, you only have literally like 30 seconds, but thanks for being uh, patient. Michael from Canoga Park. Hi. Yeah, just quick, quickly, um, the, uh, to me, the wisdom of Solomon would help out where Solomon says there's a time for everything, so there's a time to speak up and a time for silence. And mm. in Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, it says, Answer the fool according to his mm. folly least thou be, and then it said, don't answer the fool. So there's yeah. a time when you answer the fool and yep. a time when you don't. Yes, and, yes. Uh, time for it. Speak up at a time when you say, you know, it's better to keep silent in this moment. Hey, Michael, thanks for that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so it's, it's good to know we've got thoughtful listeners out there. <laughs> Michael from Canoga Park, thank you for that. You. All right, we're going to be... Uh, thanks for your call, Michael. Okay. Oh, that's great. See, uh, I wish we had like another hour, but uh, <laughs> absolutely, we will. But uh, oh my goodness, we didn't. We ran out of time. We were going to talk about uh, the use of pronouns because that's a hot topic nowadays. Yeah. Do we use it or not use it? And uh, spoiler alert here, but in the book, Tim and Sean, the authors, uh, they have a slight disagreement on this. And, and see, this is where it's good, and they both enjoy their time writing this Mm -hmm. uh they challenged each other and uh it's all in good fun and i think that's what we're doing tonight and uh again uh if if we're going to follow us guinness's advice we just keep the conversation we are practicing what we are preaching we are that's right (laughs) (laughs) but uh maybe maybe that's going to be a topic for another show should christians let's name some of these hot topic items should christians use pronouns to reach 
those who like to use pronouns. Mm -hmm. uh, should we attend gay weddings to reach uh, people who are in the gay community and show them what sympathy or empathy? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Both, maybe. But you know what I mean. What What are the other hot button topics nowadays? Uh, or oh, my goodness, politics. W when to win the fight or when to let it go? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's. There's a song about that. When to there? fold them? When, when to hold them? Hold them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's something you you have to sacrifice something to listen and give space for that. Mm. I was going to just say a quick comment on yeah. empathy. Or were you about to say something? Um, on empathy? And I, Bene Brown was lover hater. Oh yeah, no. um, but she, she has a really great short on YouTube about empathy versus sympathy, and part of what she talks about with empathy is. It's actually not necessarily feeling exactly what mm. the other person is feeling, but feeling something from your own experience that allows you to relate to them. And I think that's where Jesus can be empathetic because we have, I mean, if you agree with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says the Psalms are the, Christ was the only one who could pray the Psalms, for instance. Okay, Anna, you have the last word. Thank you for that. You have been listening to Apologetics.com, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. Our hope is that you've learned some aspect about the Christian worldview that strengthens your faith and make you want to learn more. Special thanks to my panel this evening, Jacob, Michael, and Anna, and to our behind-the-scenes sound engineer, Osmond. Special thank you to you, our listeners. And Michael from Canoga Park. Yeah, thanks for the call. Until next time, good night. <laughs>